This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this edition of In Studio. I'm your host, Drexel Gilbert. You know, most of us who live in this area are not here by accident. We live here because we want to. We love this place. We love the community. We love the people. We love the opportunities. And of course, we love our environment. We are passionate about protecting it. Tonight, I will be guiding the conversation about an innovative project that is zeroed in on protecting our environment, in this case, by restoring some of our precious shoreline. Our guests will include representatives of Keep Pensacola Beautiful and the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, as well as a local property owner who went from watching the shoreline disappear to seeing it come alive again with the collateral effort of experts and volunteers. Come along with us to The Living Shorelines, next on In Studio. Welcome to In Studio. We are calling tonight's program Living Shorelines. The title reflects not only the way we who live in Northwest Florida envision our coast, it is also the name of a state-sponsored effort that provides an environmentally friendly alternative to stabilizing waterfront property. In the process, an eroded or disappearing shoreline is returned to a natural state, in part by installing a buffer of native plants and restoring the intertidal zone and providing a home for fish and wildlife. Here for the conversation tonight are four people who are intricately involved with an impressive Living Shorelines project on the shores of Bayou Grande in Pensacola. Let's start tonight with our introductions. Jill Cleaver is the Assistant Director of Keep Pensacola Beautiful. And sitting next to her, uh, oh my, uh, rather sitting next to me here, is Beth Fugate, who is the manager with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, North um, Aquatic Preserves. And also next to her is Zach Shang, an environmental specialist with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. And finally, we have John Blackwell, who is a property owner along the shores of Bayou Grande. And we say welcome to all of you this evening. Thank you Thank so you. much for being here tonight on this important and exciting topic that we are going to talk about. Before before we get into talking about the project on Bayou Grande, I want to just um, set a little background here and I want to start with you, Beth. Let's go into a little deeper explanation of what Living Shorelines is exactly and why it's needed. What is the erosion situation? Um, well, the erosion situation is it's a global problem. We've been addressing it statewide, uh, regionally wide, um, for the southeast United States. Um, it's a process that's been exacerbated from coastal processes. Um, it's a natural occurrence. Mm -hmm. It's partly in fault from uh, processes that human nature has uh, processed along. And, and so we're trying to meet in the middle and, and do what's right to uh, further along the habitat and protect our shorelines because we all want to live by the shorelines. Right. And that's not how it's been historically. And Zach, the erosion problem really has no one source. Um, I, I kind of look at it as being, um, it's it's a it's it's nature, it's man, and we, we have to build, and um, it's time, right? I mean, that it's all of these things that are causing our shoreline to erode. Absolutely, uh, you're you're right on on all three points, um, and we've we've been having a conversation with uh, all the constituents to try and um, move forward in managing how we interact with our shoreline because. People do want to live near the water. It's one of the best parts about Florida. We have so much coastline, and we're very attracted to it. But um, in putting all of our infrastructure close to the water, we're seeing that as these natural processes occur, we have to deal with this land-water interface. And there's lots of different solutions, um, and we're trying to guide property owners to a more, more natural solutions. Okay, and so one of these natural solutions is called living shorelines. I want to talk about how that works, what you, what you do whenever you see shoreline eroded, what the Living Shorelines Project does. And and I know that in the beginning what you do is, is after the, it's identified and you see the, the erosion problem and the extent of that, um, that you go in and you begin building. 
but not like we might think of as building. And we're going to talk about that and also talk about what does restoration do whenever the shoreline is eroded and you go in to restore the shorelines. Okay, that sounds good, but for people who are wondering what does restoration do, well, on the screen you can see uh, one of the things it does is it increases the oyster population. It provides nursery and foraging grounds for fish and birds. It aids in the filtration of stormwater runoff and it reduces input of shell, the oyster shell, into the local waste stream. So now that you have that background, all you people at home that are watching, I want to go in now and talk about how the project works from start to finish. And is that something that we need to start talking about on this side of the table? More than likely. Sure. That's what I'm thinking. So what do we do? After the problem's identified, where do we go from there? Um, well, we've, we've identified project sources from uh, public lands, private lands, and we've worked um, with all constituents to to start the process. This process starts with, okay, um, what issues are you facing? And it's it's very dependent upon where the project could be. Um, we have bayous, bays, and they all have different issues to address within installing a living shoreline. Um, there's high waves, high wind energy, long fetch uh, throughout our systems. So that's usually initially where we start. Okay. Um, and then there's a permitting process. We have to uh, uh, apply for the proper permits, um, state, federal, city, whoever owns the upland portion, the submerged portion, um, everything has an owner. Right. And um, from that process, uh, funding, we always find funding for opportunities, whether it's homeowners paying for processes, grant funding, um, locating materials, and I think that's a lot of where this partnership has evolved and because there's been so many people involved in this and getting it to where it needs to be. Okay, and we're going to talk about the partnerships later. Right now on the screen we're seeing some video, and this is from Bayou Grande, and it's showing um, an area that is being um, restored. You can see the erosion there uh, that's being restored through the living shoreline. So let's let's step now to the process. Uh, you have have the the shoreline that's that's eroded, and when you go out, you take the way the way the process works is you collect. You start by collecting oyster shells, right? Right. Um, the the material the materials that we use are uh, we start out with oyster shells. Um, the oyster shells help that uh, initial protection. Uh, our main goal is stabilizing the shoreline. So if we have low wave energy, like Beth said, then sometimes we can install a project without using oyster reefs, but this particular project and a lot of our projects, we have found a huge success using oyster reefs. So what we do first is consolidate the shell into bags because the loose shell where we're placing it in the intertidal zone, there's a lot of wave energy and the shell can move around. So we consolidate the shell and we have these permitted structures. They're all uh, close to shore within 10 or 15 feet, and they're about 16 feet long, four feet wide, two feet tall. And we position them and orient them in a way that best protects the shoreline, but also there's segments in between these oyster reefs, which allows for tidal flow. And that's where the project um, takes on a more natural shape as opposed to traditional shoreline hardening. And what we're seeing now are the oyster shells that are in these bags which are biodegradable, right? So that's very eco-friendly. Everything that's being done here is, is, is done hand in glove with nature, so to speak, right? Not working against nature, but working with nature. Right. And you see that the, they're taking them and they're, they, there is a pattern for putting these, these bags of oyster shells out. And, and why is that? Uh, the pattern, it, it sort of evolved over time. Um, when we first started building oyster reefs, we didn't consolidate the shell. And then as we found that that was the way to go, we also, we didn't start out with the reefs shaped as they are now, what you will see if you go out to Bayou Grande. In fact, if you look at the reefs between Bayview Park and Bayou Grande, they look a little bit different. But uh, the form of the reef is sloped on the water side to absorb energy rather than reflect it. And it's also curved to help uh, wrap the wave energy around the reef to um, promote more absorption rather than reflection. So then behind the reef you have the intertidal zone vegetated with salt marsh vegetation. That vegetation won't live in high wave energy environments, but it works in conjunction with the oyster reefs. They're complementary in all of their functions, not just the habitat that they create, but also the stabilization function. Okay, so you get the oyster reefs in and you form this, um, this barrier that uh, and and 
but that's not where you stop because then you have to make this once again environmentally friendly and bring back the wildlife that's gone away with the erosion, right? And how is that done? Uh, it, it actually, it's done by taking natural materials and putting them where we, we see them in nature. When you go out to these projects and you look at a dock piling that's nearby, you see live oysters attached nearby. And so we're taking a natural material and we're putting it very close to where it would like to live and when we plant the plants, we're planting them a foot apart and hoping that a year from when we plant, they, they're a live, flourishing marsh. And we, we check on that by monitoring. We'll go and see, okay, we planted this many plants in this area. What is it now? And um, so we always try and, because of where we get our materials, um, we don't want a one for one. We'll take one plant and produce more plants, plant them spaced apart, and then regrow a marsh. So we want to have a net positive impact. So there you go, regrowing a marsh, okay. So now let's move to this side of the table and I wanna to talk to, to Jill Cleaver who is with uh, Keep Pensacola Beautiful. And Jill, um, you have to just be so, so thrilled about this project because in Pensacola we are so aware of our shorelines and we are so uh, aware of what time and nature and man has, has done inadvertently sometimes, you know, or just because it's the force of nature that's eroded some of the shoreline. And in doing that, taken away the, the wildlife that live there, the fish and, and the grasses and, and what makes it wonderful. So tell me how Keep Pensacola Beautiful got involved with the Living Shorelines Project. Okay, well, um, we started out, um, it was uh, FTP's project and they would, were going out and they had a program where they were collecting shell from, um, restaurants all the way from Perdido Key to like Fort Walton Beach. And Zach here was the driver and he was going around and picking all the shell up. And he was doing that all by himself and each one of these containers weighs 160 pounds. And he was doing that by himself and he said, hey, keep Pensacola beautiful. We, you have some volunteers, we'd like, can you help me? And so we did. And at some point in time, uh, FTP said, you know, keep Pensacola, why don't you write the grant? and you pick up the shell, and then what they can do, the stuff that they do really well, which is what plants need to go there, talk with homeowners. And so we kind of took the, the shell collection away from them, and we were the ones that submitted for the grant to do these projects. Okay, so let's talk about the shell collection because that is critical to the projects that have been in Pensacola. And we've talked about how they're not necessary in all of the projects, but they've been critical to this. So, so where do you get the shells again? We get the shells from uh, five restaurants, um, Shaggy's, Peg Lake Pete's, Grand Marlin, Redfish Bluefish, and uh, Shocks. Okay, so you get the, the is, and, and what's another benefit of being able to collect these shells from the various restaurants? Well, one, they don't go into the Ferdito landfill. And so we have collected 192 tons of shell in this grant that we are doing um, for this project. Uh, we started out and we had collected, uh, we had a goal, I think, of 80 some tons and we collected 99 the first year we did it. And uh, each year, like I said, we were at 99 the first year we did a grant and then we were at 135 and now we're at 192. Okay, so, so and, and you don't just collect these shells and go throw them out there. They have to go through a process. So talk to me about that. They do. Uh, we have a new partner this year. We're really excited and that was Pensacola State um, College and they gave us a big parking lot next to their Warrington campus and it allows us to put the shell really thin so that it dries out within three, three months and it has to be dry and um, we take it there, we put it all out there and after it dries then that's when we shovel it and put it in the bags that you saw in the video. Okay, so we're talking about this process now. We're talking about um, restaurants that give you the oysters um, we're talking about people that go pick up the oysters, or oyster shells, and then people take the oyster shells to the place to be cleaned and to spread out and to bagged up. That's a lot of volunteer effort, isn't There's it? There's a lot of volunteer hours. In fact, I think I got the number here somewhere. Uh, right now on this project, about 3,500 hours that we, and we're not even, we're even done. We haven't even planted plants yet. Okay. But the shell collection is, is the most laborious part uh, each one of those bags weighs 20 pounds. Each one has to be filled. Uh, we do it on hot August days, and people are glad to do it. They, they uh, have a lot of volunteer groups that have come out and helped us. 
Okay, so these projects are going, I want to talk more about the volunteers in a little bit, but John, I want to get to you because um, as, as Beth has told us, you know, this is not just a, a, a matter that's of concern to the Pensacola area where we live. It's, it's obviously, it's a global concern with erosion, but, and, and in the state of Florida. But in Pensacola, uh, two areas that have greatly benefited from the Living Shorelines Initiative are um, Bayou Grande, which is being worked on right now, and then Bayview Park and Bayou Tahar. But Bayou Grande is where you are a property owner, John Blackwell. Um, you have been a property owner there for five years. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the extent of the erosion that you've seen happen during that time period. It's, it's been it's been mind blowing actually. It's you know we've been there five years and we've probably lost you know, ten to fifteen depending on where, where, which part of the shoreline ten to fifteen foot of, of not necessarily the shoreline itself but the uplands washing away from the from the erosion. So no, it's the shoreline, but it's mostly the uplands part of it. Um, and just, you can see it eating away. And I've had a section of the sidewalk going out to my dock that it just undermined and I had to actually take the two sections of concrete out before it collapsed. Um, so it's uh, it's been... Um, we're looking at some of the video uh, that's describing what you're talking about now. In addition to the loss of the of the the land per se or the sand or the shoreline, what else do you see going away? Well, a lot of the, 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 uh, the vegetation there, you know, is, is not there. It hasn't been there since we got there. Um, there's been a little bit. Um, and then you don't see any of the, the creatures, the, you know, the minnows and the, you know, the small shrimp and that sort of thing. Since there's no vegetation for them to attach to or live around or have protection, they're out there. You can see them, you know, somewhat around the pilings and stuff like that, but there's not a lot of habitat for them. Um, okay. Um, and. In the, the short period of time that this particular project has been going on, and what are we talking about? Is a couple of months now, three months maybe, that this has been? It started since in it December. First started? December. Yeah, that's right. Have you been able to, to see any difference yet, or are you, you watching for it closely? I'm watching for it closely. I've taken a lot of pictures, you know, kind of time lapse as we go, but it's been amazing how quickly the sand is starting to build up behind the reefs. Uh, the ones we did in December, um, there's probably I don't know, six to eight foot of sand built up behind them. I've had neighbors come to me and, and that, that, has, has, that weren't really interested in participating initially, and now they're they're seeing what it can do, and now they're like, how, how do you do that, or how do you how do you get involved in that program? <laughs> so uh, it's it's definitely a, a very quick. Um, impact that you can tell a difference in. So. And that's something to talk about. Um, th this is a, this entire project in, involves partnerships from corporate sponsors that help with underwriting with the grants um, to the, the volunteers that help. Obviously the state works hand in glove with Keep Pensacola Beautiful. Um, what is the involvement with the property owners as far as a partnership goes? And, and I'm not sure who would get that question. Well, okay. it's all different depending on which projects we're we're doing okay. um, for this specifically for this project. They've been amazing. They've been out there helping bag, helping build. Um, there's a lot of upland component that's involved in this project because it's so long, and there's uh, failing seawalls that need to be pulled out. And from the get go, I mean, they were the ones that approached us about installing this project, and they said, you know, whatever we need to do, we will get this done. Um, so, I mean amazing support from all So of people who are out there right now watching this are saying I need to do this. You know, I need to get my my neighbors together. We need to we need to do something about this. What steps should they take? Um, we're actually putting together a brochure um, with the help of uh, IFAS Extension Sea Grant agent um, and on this whole process from start to finish um, what processes are needed, where they're at, where to find permits, um, how to submit the permits, who to contact for assistance in addition to um, hiring consultants to help install the project. Okay, and actually we have a couple of websites that we will put up for you at the bottom of the screen throughout the program if you would desire some more information on this. Zach, from a scientific standpoint, um, John says he's watching closely mm -hmm. to see any changes and any positive. Um, can you see something we can't see when you go out there in terms of how, if, it's, if it's coming back? And if so, what are you anticipating to see and how quickly? Well. Um, every shoreline is different and I've been involved in close to 50 different projects. Some of them were 50 feet long and some of them were upwards of 3,000. And uh, what, we're using similar materials and similar techniques on each shoreline and they all respond a little bit differently. And it has to do with those natural processes we were talking about because um, erosion is, is all about the interaction between land and sea. So um, when I put oyster reefs in, 
in attempts to slow down wave energy and trap sediment, it's, it's not immediate. Uh, what I, what, what the end result that I want isn't immediate, but you can see an immediate reaction to the sand that's naturally flowing along the shoreline starts to get caught up a little bit, and uh, that's the substrate that we need to plant. So um, we always install the oyster reefs to create that perfect environment for the plants in an area where we know the plants won't survive on their own. So we usually, if we can build oyster reefs, uh, we, we like to plant plants in the winter, fall and winter when the tides are low. So depending on when we put the reefs in, we'll put plants in as long as at least a couple months has gone by. We'll finish planting this project uh, probably in the winter of this year. Okay. And that's something also that you do work with the property owners in, in terms of the selection of the, the plants that go into the water, right? So so there's input. And, and again, it's it, this it's just a, such a, a wonderful collaboration of so many different groups coming together. Yeah, there, there are some types of vegetation that they don't really have much of a choice because we call them our cash crop. We're growing a specific type of grass. It's a wetland grass that's salt tolerant and it lives in the environment that we're seeing erode. So we're stabilizing that, that little patch of shoreline and getting that perfect plant to grow there. Then when you move into the uplands, we have lots of different options, but everything we grow is natural, native, salt tolerant. Um, but we want the biodiversity, and that's we definitely have a dialogue with the property owners, and it depends on where they are in the area, because um, we have lots of different ecotones. If you're closer to the beach, you can have plants that you see out on the dune, but uh, if you're in a bayou, typically it's just a couple salt marsh species and then whatever you want in your uplands. Okay. Well, we're going to take a brief break, and when we come back, we're going to talk more about the Living Shorelines program, how it might be beneficial to a shoreline near you, and how you can get information on perhaps becoming a part of the project, either as a beneficiary of it um, or as a volunteer to help restore our precious shorelines in Northwest Florida. We'll be right back. WSRE Public Television and the Escambia Elementary Principals Association congratulate these Shining Star Award recipients. These students were selected upon the basis of good citizenship and adherence to the core values adopted by the Escambia County School System. Equality, responsibility, integrity, respect, honesty, and patriotism. Congratulations to all of these outstanding students.
Welcome back to In Studio. I'm your host, Rexel Gilbert. If you are just joining us, our topic tonight is the Living Shorelines Project, specifically what's going on right now on the shores of Bayou Grande. It's a collaborative effort between the State Department of Environmental Protection, Keep Pensacola Beautiful, grant sponsors such as Southern Company, and many volunteers, all of whom have the common desire to stem the tide of erosion along our beautiful coastlines. In doing so, employing environmentally friendly restoration techniques. Now, as we've talked about through the program, this is erosion of the shorelines is not a problem that is unique to Northwest Florida or even to the state of Florida. Um, it is a global concern, and in being a global concern, there are also many global initiatives to try and restore shorelines that have been eroded due to nature and time and to man's building. Um, I want to talk to Jill Cleaver right now, though, and talk about the Living Shorelines Program. And there are projects throughout the state of Florida uh, with this, but how is it making a difference in our backyard where okay. we live? Well, I think we need to go back to the very first uh, grant, uh, Five Star and Urban Waters grant that we partnered with FDP, and that was at Bayview Park, where we were designed it to build a demonstration area of what a living shoreline was. And that goes back to early in 2011, 2012, and we partnered with City of Pensacola, and it was a very, very big, successful project that we did. And then we've had that a follow-on, and we w continued on in Bayou Tahar and did uh, 10 pro properties. and. Um, so we have the demonstration area now, and this is actually our third project that we've done in conjunction with them, and we'd like to do more. How, how bad was the problem at Bayview Park and then again at Bayou Tahar, and what has happened since the Living Shorelines reefs were put in? What, mm -hmm. What's taken place there? Well, I'm going to have to refer back to Zach on that. Talk to us about that. How bad was the problem? What, what was the problem, and how has this reef initiative helped? The Bayview Park was an interesting project because uh, our mayor was very motivated to do something down there and there wasn't a glaring erosion problem like Mr. Blackwell has and like a lot of people have um, and that was that had a lot more emphasis on habitat restoration um, than it did erosion control. Uh, there, there happened to be a really really dense stand of what we consider a nuisance species of, of vegetation. It's a grass everyone's familiar with in the area, maybe not by name, but you, you would recognize it. It looks like bamboo. We call it Phragmites. And the, the biggest component of that project, aside from getting the, the materials in that we wanted, was removing the Phragmites. And that took a huge effort from City of Pensacola. Um, uh, they, they, were, they, they provided the heavy machinery that, that we needed to pull out the vegetation that we didn't want there. And what the problem with Phragmites is it creates a monoculture. It, it chokes everything out. It grows 15 feet tall. And it actually was kind of holding the shoreline in place. But when we removed it, we saw that there was some irregular, ir irregularities to the shoreline. And the, the end result was they smoothed everything out with some fill or, or sand that was actually dredged from Bayou Tahar Channel. So uh, to maintain the channel out the mouth of Bayou Tahar, they dredge it and they pile it up. We took that clean sand and re-sloped the shoreline at Bayview Park and revegetated it with uh, native plants, native salt tolerant plants. So when you go there, you can see the oyster reefs in the water and a really um, consistent salt marsh profile where the plants are very happy in their specific zones that they like to grow in all the way up into the, the flowering plants in the uplands. And so the habitat um, restoration as opposed to erosion control or, or there, um, what, what happens to the water? Does it come back to life then as far as, you know, your... your well, I, I mean, I would say since the, the project implementation, I mean, we've heard homeowners saying they're seeing dolphins in the bayou again. Um, just recently, um, I went and inspected the site and we have um, a seagrass, Rupia maritima, growing. It, it's been patchy within the system. It, it's flourishing. So just the diversity in that site alone is, is impressive. So we hope, you know, the, the project implementation from the oysters to the salt marsh vegetation to now the, the seagrass is coming in will help clarify and clear up and improve the water quality, not only for the water quality, but for the habitat, the recreation. And so, something else that uh, it made me think of uh, another project, which we might talk about later, but an unforeseen benefit um, 
And it wasn't like a, a hugely scientific thing, but right after we finished building our very first reef at Bayview Park, and we were getting ready to leave for the day and take a picture, a pelican floated in and landed on the reef. And it, it's actually a graphic that we use for some of our signage now and certificates, but it was sort of a surreal moment when we, we finished placing this habitat there and, and a bird swooped in and landed right there just to kind of look around. Uh, but birds do use it for foraging, but when we're talking about erosion control and habitat restoration, one of the things you're not usually thinking of is, is birds, um, but they're absolutely a, a, a component of the, the habitat. There's your sign of affirmation right there. <laughs> it's the equivalent it, it of a was. rainbow after it, the storm, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that I really like that, I, that I'm hearing from you guys is that how, how ecologically and environmentally friendly this is. You're going in and using nature to restore nature, more or less. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, sure. Uh, there's a, in fact, a, that's kind of a, it's our main motivator in, in restoring habitat is, uh, you know, what is habitat? Right. So we ha you have to use the habitat to restore habitat. Um, we, we do, well, the way we place oyster reefs is, uh, it, it, it does make the project sort of hybrid. Um, we're, we're altering the, the natural shell a little bit from where it would be found naturally. Now, the live oysters are there, but they wouldn't necessarily mound themselves in the way that we mound them. But um, because of our interactions with the shoreline, we're, we're faced with these erosion problems, and we have to do something. We've found that the, the certain plants that like to live in that area, they can't tolerate certain, certain wave energies. So uh, that's where we bring in, that's where we brought in the oyster shell, but it's not always oyster shell. We work with companies that create coconut fiber products that uh, degrade very fast. And when we think we can use that in lieu of putting a, even an oyster reef out there, we'll, we'll use that. Sometimes we work on a shoreline that's very shallow. We put oysters out there, it, it will just be shell and there won't be many live oysters that can even settle there. So in those situations, we will try and use other natural materials. Okay. Um, John, I want to talk about um, what property owners or um, even rec recreational users of our waters can look for that might signal, hey, this may be the beginning of the problem. Or in John's case, as he quickly watched his, the, you know, the, the shoreline erode, what are some of the things that are red flags that we need to look for? I mean, when we see that the, that the shoreline is eroding or the habitat is disappearing? Um, I think that when, uh, like we said over and over, erosion is natural. So if, if we had no interaction, no human interaction with the shoreline, um, the way it works in a nutshell, mountains uh, erode from rain, they turn into boulders and rocks, and all this sediment, uh, by the time it gets down to our beautiful bay system, it's very well sorted and it's, it's, it turns into sand. Um, and it... it settles out to the bottom and that sand is constantly making its way out to the Gulf of Mexico. The sand's rolled up and it creates barrier islands and, and it encloses these bay systems that we have. So um, the, the sand, if, if you cut off the transport, if you cut off the transport then you'll, you will notice that you'll start to see tree roots and you'll start to see vertical areas of your shoreline. When the sand can naturally flow along the shoreline, you're going to see a slope like you go see at the beach. If you go to Pensacola Beach, you're not just walking from a cliff into the water. It's a nice sloping beach. So that's the main thing that Mr. Blackwell has seen at his property. When you have a vertical structure interfacing the water, the energy of the water is, is relentless. It will just eat away at that, at that vertical, what we call a scarp. So that's a red flag for any property owner. If you see uh, the water lapping into your land uh, and it's not gently sloping up into vegetation or a, a sand interface, that, that would be a major problem. What are some of the things that we can do as individuals to try and head that off? How can we be proactive other than coming to you when a situation like Mr. Blackwell's neighborhood along Bayou Grande or, or what was going on at Bayou Tahar? Um, how can we just as individuals and responsible citizens what, what can we do? What's our role? I think one of the, the critical components to creating these habitats is um, stopping shoreline hardening. Um, that's part of our initiative in the Living Shoreline Initiative um, is to look for softer sides. There's a lot of different components to a living shoreline and there's any, lots of things that you can do, whether it's just plants, 
I mean, we've uh, planted plants in front of bulkheads um, quite successfully. Um, Seawalls and bulkheads have a, a finite life, whereas these coastal processes um, with the living shoreline, they're adaptive. So they create the habitat, they're adaptive, and unfortunately with a seawall, it creates a bathtub effect. Um, there's nothing for nutrient uptake, there's nothing for fish to swim in, birds to eat off of, you're just dead in the water. So that's really one of the things that we've progressed with is, you know, we all love to see the birds, we all love to fish, we all want the crabs, but getting the the two in sync at the fact that you know hardening of these lo of these walls is creating these problems so if we can promote uh, public and, and private landowners to continue with the natural processes of, of plants and, and vegetation and oysters then it continues the process and, and lets the adaptation happen. I can speak a little bit more to that uh, in the past several years we've made strides uh, on the regulatory side of things Everything that we do is regula regulated by Army Corps of Engineers and the State of Florida Department of Environmental Protection. And long before we got in the game, the, there's, uh, people started noticing that certain structures, uh, one example is a groin. A groin is a, a hardened structure that goes out perpendicular from the shoreline. And the idea is that the groin captures that sediment that should be naturally flowing, and usually it'll pile up on one side and erode on the other. Those are now very illegal. So that's one thing that the state did and, and other uh, nations all over the world have adopted similar practices to, to limit the amount of structure on the shoreline. So it's kind of a, it's, it's a, not the best answer you want to hear, do nothing, but that's really the main message is if you have a natural shoreline, the best thing is to leave it natural. And one mistake I see property owners make is they'll mow their grass all the way down to the water. And they might have some grass down there that, that might be salt tolerant and native, but they'll mow it down. And that, that disrupts the natural state of that shoreline. And they could have absolutely no problem whatsoever until they go down and mow right to the water. So one thing is do nothing. Another thing is, you know, back off what you do a little bit. Leave, leave, it, leave it be. Um, but like she said, we've done some projects in front of shorelines that are already hardened. Um, sometimes we adopt problems, and you can't just... There's not, sometimes there's not a simple answer to just removing hardened structure. So by placing the habitat offshore of the hardening, we, we at least get a little bit of that interaction back, and we stop the bathtub effect, which is basically waves bouncing off vertical walls. Well, I like what you were talking about with the homeowners and, and the, the, the advice that you're giving on, on different things like not mowing all the way down. And, John, I want to come back to you about, about this because I know that, there was, what, seven property seven owners property in, owners. in the Bayou Grande project there. Um, what do you see? You, t you briefly touched on it earlier about how, after you got it started, they're like, oh, I think I might want to do that too. How Have you seen the excitement spread and the interest in that? And, and, and property owners... And, and like I said earlier, recreational users of our water uh, waters, because we live here, we're concerned about that. Tell me what you see in terms of the interest of restoring the shorelines. Yeah, and as you said, there's seven different property owners in, in our project, which is about 1,200 feet long. And each, each property was unique in, in certain ways. Mine probably had the, <clears throat> the most uplands um, erosion issue. Uh, two of the property owners had uh, hardened bulkheads that were had collapsed because of uh, they were old and, and storm damage hit them and, and just the constant, as, they, as Zach mentioned earlier, just the constant wave action beating on them, they kind of deteriorated um, and collapsed. Um, and then some of the others um, really didn't have uplands part, but it, you, you, can see, you can see from the pictures earlier some of the roots from the trees and stuff mm -hmm. like that where over time they've, they've, they've eroded away. Uh, and it's been mixed emotion. Like I said, there was some, some of the seven jumped on board right away and others were reluctant and they were concerned about how they looked and after they did a little more research into it. And my wife even was, was apprehensive at first wondering how it was going to look and now she's she's really, you know, I don't know whether she's warming up to it or just, the, you know, really sincere about it, but she she really likes the way they're, they're, they're they've, they've you know, Zach and them have done a great job of lining them up and they're, they're actually quite attractive now and I think when the grass comes in behind them they'll even be better. So, so the, the enthusiasm spreads um, mm -hmm. as, as you see what's taking place uh, not just among the, the property owners who will see benefit um, but Jill the enthusiasm has spread 
a huge volunteer base and we're going to take a break but when we come back I want to talk about how so many people in the area are jumping on board for this program and getting involved and if you want to get involved how you can do that as well. We'll be right back. WSRE's van has been wrapped with many of the favorite PBS characters that kids of all ages have come to know and love. Big Bird Elmo, the reading heroes from Super Y, and two favorite PBS canines, Clifford the Big Red Dog and Martha the Talking Dog from Martha Speaks. Also featured is Cat in the Hat from the new PBS kids show, The Cat in the Hat, and there's a lot about that. You'll also see the Raising Readers logo, a reminder of the very important mission that WSRE has to make a difference in literacy in our community by providing quality, curriculum-based children's programs and outreach services. This van is used by WSRE's production crew and can be seen at schools and community events. You may even see it when you're driving around the Gulf Coast region. It's a moving billboard for WSRE and a reminder that we're more than just TV. WSRE is your partner in education, helping our kids learn and grow. We're raising readers. Welcome back to In Studio. I'm your host, Drexel Gilbert, and tonight we are discussing shoreline erosion and shoreline restoration. If we could pull the graphic back up quickly, and I want to talk about what restoration does, for those of you who might have missed that at the beginning of the program, uh, we're talking about a specific restoration project right now that's underway in Pensacola on the shores of Bayou Grande. Um, so when we talk about erosion of shorelines and we talk about in going in and restoring it, the question is, so what does it do? Well, this is part of what it does. It increases the oyster population. It provides nursery and foraging grounds for fish and birds, which are so important to our ecology. It aids in the filtration of stormwater runoff, and it reduces input of shell into the local waste stream. And the reason that that happens is because um, these are oyster shells that are donated to this project by various restaurants and so that also keeps those um, those shells it puts them back in their natural environment so to speak and keeps them out of the landfill as Jill said earlier. Before we went into the break we were talking about uh, volunteers and the fact that once this project gets underway, it really catches fire in terms of catches people's imagination. They get enthusiastic. They want to help. Um, but it's not just the state, keep Pensacola beautiful, and the property owners that get excited about it. You have an army of volunteers. We do. Who are these people? Where do they come from? Why are they here? <laughs> they just call us all the time, and we just they just love doing it. And um, Anybody can get involved. If you have a group that wants to get involved, just give us a ring and we will set up oyster bagging or oyster reef building. But um, to name some of the ones that we've had, we've had um, um, students from that are involved in AmeriCorps that are coming down and uh, maybe they're helping with Habitat for the Tornado and then they come over and help us and, and do something else. We've had a lot of Navy. Navy is the one, um, NATTC, that you saw that was a group of uh, uh, people that are studying to be chief petty officers, that's who you saw in the video earlier. Uh, all kinds of divisions from, from the U.S. military, uh, Naval Information Operations um, Command, uh, there's a training squadron there. Uh, We're looking at from, some of the volunteers, I believe, yeah, here. Yeah, that, that was the Navy, Navy there. But University of West Florida, 
all kinds of different groups from there, and I'm probably going to miss on some of them. Oh. But and you said Pensacola North, State College as well. Pensacola State South? College. We had University of Missouri that was down in um, January. So this really, I, it I think it speaks to what's going on um, really globally as far as the renewed concern about our environment. I think mm -hmm. that we are realizing that this, our environment is a precious resource that we have to be proactive about protecting mm -hmm. and then when we do have a loss, if we have the opportunity to restore to be able to do that. Have you had any special stories where someone says, I just had to come do this because I care so much about where I live? I think most of that may be from, from the students uh, we've had teachers that have come in, like from Gulf Breeze uh, Marine uh, Science class. We have students that have come from Pine Forest High School, uh, students that are involved from Washington High School. And I think they're interested in the education component of it. They want to see, uh, they want to like measure water quality. They want to um, kind of just get in there and get their hands wet and, and actually take it into the classroom, what species are there you know, what numbers. Uh. And, and Zach, we were talking in the break, this is it, what, you, you do have great cooperation and partnership with the schools, and I want you to, to talk about that because I know you worked with them. It's great because we're educating the next generation. Right. Um, about the importance of what you're doing. Absolutely. Uh, we have, uh, through a program called Grasses to Classes, or Grasses in Classes, we have um, supplied several local schools with a stock of grasses. And the way the program works is we go into the school and we, we build the, the whole message into their curriculum. So they help us with the hands-on stuff from start to finish. Uh, we tell them about plant maintenance in our talk about why the plants are important. And uh, they, they help us with some of the labor and the maintenance and then while they're doing that through the school year, they're also taking water samples in the water near where these projects are going and they're comparing and contrasting <coughs> different types of sites and they're also pulling nets through the water and seeing what uh, organisms there, fish and shrimp and crabs, and they're, they're, they're keeping all of this data for us. And what's great is I, w I went to, I was in a marine science class in high school and we went to the beach and we picked up things, but there was, the, even if it was tied into how it was important, there, there wasn't really good training for, for the professional world. And what these programs are doing are training these kids to want to go into science, science careers or at least get a science degree. Um, so at the end of the school year, once their plants are grown out, they come and help us plant. And throughout the process, we've had some of these kids get excited about it and come help us build oyster reefs. Um, if I forget to let them know, they'll call me up and, and, and give me a hard time, like, hey, why didn't you let me know? Uh, so they, they do get excited about about mm -hmm. coming out. Um, what are some of the comments you get from them? I, 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 did, did they realize before going into this um, how critical an issue of environmental protection really is? I think that everyone, I mean, if, if any, uh, most people are aware that, that uh, we have a lot of issues with the environment. So when, they, when they're when they finding us, whether it's an email from Keep Pensacola Beautiful, they're kind of, their radar's already, already out there. Volunteers don't just they don't often just stumble in the project. They're looking for something to do. So they do know that, that the environment is important. But what I get when they get out there is this is really cool. I did not know that this was going on. I didn't know this existed at all. When I'm eating an oyster at the restaurant, I don't think about it turning into an oyster reef. So... Um, they also mentioned how, how much work it is. <laughs> <laughs> and it is a lot of work, but you know, nothing of value comes easily, right? That's Absolutely. what my mama always said anyway. So it, there is a lot of work and a lot of science that goes into this. And there's also a lot of elbow grease, right? A lot of elbow grease. And, and the other side of this is too that not only is this ecologically benefiting, but it's economically benef benefiting. Without these habitats here, um, the species disappear, our birds disappear, our grasses disappear, the filtration, uh, for our water systems, it, it's gone. So by putting these back, it, it helps our fisheries. And like I said, at Baby Park, we've got seagrasses coming back in. These are very important habitats. that are nursery and fisheries grounds for some of our larger fish. And without these, they're gone. Our fisheries, you know, our recreation's gone, and, and that's a, a common driver for the state. Now, um, we talked about uh, the partnerships, too. I want to get back to that because these things... They don't happen without money, too. You have to have 
You have to have money to help fund it. And I know that there's a partnership you wanted to talk about. Yeah. Um, besides um, the oyster collection with Keep Pensacola Beautiful, we have um, a funding source on our end that um, through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Foundation Coastal Program, they give us grant funds to implement the living shoreline. Um, so they've paid for staff and materials to actually permit the projects, install the project, um, grow the plants um, in conjunction with other grant funding as well. And again, the help of volunteers. Um, the homeowners have put in considerable funds to do the work on the uplands component that needs to be done as well. So um, briefly, I want to talk, Jill, just a moment. We don't, we're don't. we getting close on time, but talk to me about some of the other things that Keep Pensacola Beautiful is doing, because I know you're intricately involved in this project right now, but you have a lot going on that's benefiting where we live, work, and play. Yes, we do that all the time. We do beautification projects. We're involved in recycling and recycling education. We have a component on the website where we can find out how do you recycle something in Pensacola. You just go to our website and you can find out. The other thing is a big litter, litter awareness. And in fact, we're doing March 19th um, this month. We're partnering with uh, Beth and, and, and their organization to do a litter awareness called the Great American Cleanup. And we do that down at Project Green Shores, which is down at the foot of Three Mile Bridge, Bayfront Parkway, uh, at the uh, Missing Children's Memorial down there. And we meet at 8 o'clock, and we also have Ocean Hour that's going to be down there participating. And it's all litter awareness, and it's actually at one of the model green, uh, living shoreline here in Pensacola is down there at Project Green Shores. Good and deal. we've been doing that for like 10 years down then. So we do a lot of litter awareness okay. and litter pickups and roadside litter stuff too. So you have a lot going on. We do. Okay. Beth, um, I know that, or I think I know that you don't work <laughs> as hand in glove with volunteers perhaps as, as Jill might. But you, but you understand the critical imp importance and you can talk about from the state side of that too and how people can get involved. What should they do? They're watching this program. They want to be a part of this. Yeah, I mean, they can they can contact us. Um, we have a Facebook page at, uh, on Northwest Florida Aquatic Preserves. Um, you can contact us via the page, keep up to date with what we're doing. Not only do we do uh, ecosystem restoration projects, um, we also manage three aquatic preserves in the Panhandle. Um, so in conjunction with everything that's going on, we also do water quality sampling. Um, we have several greenhouse facilities that we take care of. We get an influx of volunteers who we couldn't do it without them. So. And you don't have to be a scientist to volunteer, right? Absolutely not, no. <laughs> no. And, and what, what, are, what are the qualifications? I, I mean, we, we take church groups, Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, um, anybody that wants to get involved. We love you guys, and we appreciate the help. Closed toed shoes. Yeah, that, that's it, huh? that's yeah. the qualification. Closed toed shoes. And, and Keep Pensacola Beautiful posts on the very first page of our website. We post our events that you mm -hmm. can vol and have a volunteer event. We, we post a lot of them out there. Okay. So they can like reach out and we'll, we'll help, let them help us. Okay, and John, I know that you're spreading the word with, uh, with property owners about the benefits of this program. Yeah, yeah every chance I get, I, I promote it and, and Zach and Jill and, and, uh, and Beth have all done a great job helping you know, helping me along the process because it's it's all new to me, uh, and they've been very helpful. And um, and as far as benefits, as far as uh, contributions too, uh, as as uh, Beth mentioned earlier, U.S. Fish and Wildlife has been a great sponsor as well as Gulf Power and Southern Company. So. Okay, um, so as we move to our final break, any last comments that you want to add about the project, what's going on in Pensacola? I do want to let you know, if we can pull that graphic up one more time, if you want to go out and take a look at what's going on, um, see for yourself what's happening with the building of these oyster reefs as far as it goes to shoreline restoration. We have a graphic up. You can go to Bayou Tahar um, and Bayview Park, and that's the intersection of 20th and Mallory Street. I'm sure most, if not all of you who are watching this program are familiar with that area. And then also the one that's at, that's currently underway and, and still in the process is at Bayou Grande at, the, uh, Grande at the intersections of Gordon and Wayne Avenue. So you're welcome to go check it out, see if maybe you want to volunteer, be a part of this effort. Uh, perhaps that you are aware of a shoreline or a habitat that is in need of a project like this and you can contact um, the Department of Environmental Protection or you can contact Keep Pensacola Beautiful. Now Jill, you have something in your hands. What might that I be? I do. <laughs> this is the uh, 
brown pelican that uh, Zach alluded to that landed on our very first reef at Bayou. Um, there we go. Oh, there's the picture. Park. Yeah. And we give this certificate out to anybody that comes out to help participate with us, and we wanted to give you one as being a partner in helping us spread the word about living shorelines. Well, on behalf of WSRE TV, I with great pleasure accept this certificate. Thank you so much. Well, can we get another shot of the pelican? I like am totally in love with pelicans. So <laughs> this is a great shot. And you said he just happened to tell us the story again, Zach. It, it was it it couldn't have been more than one minute after we laid the last bag and we were exhausted dragging ourselves out of the water, just compiling ourselves for a picture and he just flew into the frame. He fell and in so we, we, I think we shifted maybe six <laughs> inches six to the inches. left. Six hey, I had, inches. I had the camera on him. Yes. We were taking a Can picture of the last that? volunteers like, hey, we did it. And then he just slid in the picture. It's like the pelican's going in, give me five. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And we are very pleased to accept this. And we are going to take a quick break and then we will be back for some final words. day of the year we bring the news that matters to you and every day of the year we rely on member support to power this work your renewal or special gift right now will help keep WSRE strong thank you for your splendid support WSRE Public Television and the Escambia Elementary Principals Association congratulate these Shining Star Award recipients. These students were selected upon the basis of good citizenship and adherence to the core values adopted by the Escambia County School System. Equality, responsibility, integrity, respect, honesty, and patriotism. Congratulations to all of these outstanding students. Well, I hope that you have enjoyed tonight's program and that you've learned something about um, the erosion problems in our area. But the good news about that is the initiatives to help restore our shorelines and our water habitats. If you would like to know more about the Living Shorelines Initiative, you have questions about whether it may be appropriate for your area, you want to know about volunteering on a Living Shorelines project or provide assistance in any way, there are websites that we've had on the screen throughout the program you can check out. You can get in touch with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and keep Pensacola beautiful. My thanks again to our guests who provided us with great information and who are dedicated to restoring at least some of the natural wonder of our area that's been lost to erosion caused by man, by nature, and by time. Coming up next time on In Studio, Ramika Vincent Leary will take us out to the ball game as we explore America's oldest pastime, baseball. The show will examine a rich Pensacola connection spanning the Negro Leagues to the Major Leagues. On behalf of executive producer Mike Rowan, our director for the evening, Ted King, and all of our fabulous In Studio production crew, thank you for joining us. I'm Drexel Gilbert, wishing you a pleasant evening.